Our final speaker is Joanna Love of the <laughs> University of Richmond. And her paper, I believe I have some confidence to say, the title is <laughs> Selling, <laughs> Selling Difference, <laughs> Sonic Humanist, and Racial Tension in Contemporary Advertising. So I will take you down a few, and then, you know, after I'm done, you can take me down some more. <laughs> Rollo Bart once argued that advertisements promote myths that work to distort that which they seek to signify. More recently, media scholars have determined that American advertising not only reproduces cultural ideologies, but also perpetuates and even shapes them. My talk focuses on a recent commercial for the Geico Insurance Company that features the hip hop group of Salt and Peppa and DJ Cinderella yeah. performing their 1987 hit, Push It. This spot provides a lens for considering how marketers select and borrow specific signifiers from popular music to boost their cultural capital and to communicate corporate messages, often at the expense of the musicians and the songs that they feature. I offer a close yet brief reading of the commercial's music and images to investigate how this commercial uses salt and pepper's diegetic performance to reproduce hegemonic values. I aim to suggest a few ways to read this commercial and to promote discussion about the ways that advertising reproduces real-world racial tensions and ultimately reinforces the oppression and exclusion of marginalized peoples. Geico's Push It commercial was created as part of an eight-part campaign titled, It's What You Do. Each features an American pop culture icon and places them in an improbable scenario that call attention to the commercials as ads. These spots attempt to create humor by showing that these icons don't belong anywhere in real life. Notably, Salt and Peppa's commercial created the most gut buzz. Geico paid $4.5 million for it to air during the 2015 Super Bowl. The spot was praised as a piece of humor and 1980s nostalgia that exposed new generations to the group's music. The, trio, or the media reported that the trio used it to hype their summer concert appearances and that the attention they received led to a spike in record sales. Before watching the commercial, let's consider the original song and its video. Push It originally appeared on the group's 1987 album and received considerable success when it was remixed and re-released the following year. Push It was one of the first rap singles to top the dance charts and to receive a Grammy nomination. Sociologist Athena Lafros ascribes this song's popularity to its, quote, unrelenting dance beat and bold, sexy attitude, end quote. She also notes that it upholds recurring themes that appear throughout Salt and Pepa's albums, namely their ability to, ability to speak to black, female empowerment, and sexuality. Push It is thus a song about a woman's physical enjoyment, both sexually and on the dance floor. While the song is easily identified by its syncopated synthesized melody, the track's lyrical hook relies heavily on the intertextuality of multiple throwbacks to funk, soul, and pop rock records. We can hear the first three in this clip. Hits. 
The lyrics performed by Selma Peppa also focus agency on the female body, while their New York borough accents and rap delivery remind us that they come from the marginalized black roots of hip hop and that they are pioneers of the genre's mainstream success. Therefore, just as Lauren Kajikawa demonstrates that audiences could hear racialized markers of time, place, and space in early rap songs, I would argue that as part of this era, Pusha Push It also sonically locates Salt and Peppa within their racialized cultural moment. Of course, as Robert James points out in her work on the conjectural body, ideologies about music and race are tied to gender, as well as class and age. Soul and Peppa's track thus calls attention to their racialized and gendered bodies. These signifiers are amplified during the rap in the music video, where we see their gold chains, black bodysuits, oversized leather jackets, and emphasis on sexually suggested choreography. Here we see the duo following a middle-aged white man as he mows his lawn. 
Notice the commercial's final sounds come from his over-articulation of the song's hook. <laughs> While this scene pokes fun of this man's non-hip whiteness, it's significant that he gets the last word. I would point out that his deadpan voice serves as a sonic signifier of his race and gender, and it works to directly oppose the signifiers of salt and pepper we've heard thus far. Thus, this man's tongue-in-cheek performance works to contrast and even mock Salt and Peppa's seemingly sincere performances in an attempt to create humor. But there's also more going on here. In Linda Seal, whose discussion of fetishized black bodies in Australian advertising, she confirms that in many advertisements, quote, the self needs the other in order to have meaning, end quote. Thus, the fundamental tension in the spot comes from the opposition between white, often male bodies, and black female bodies and their aesthetics. Taking this a step further, by having the final say, this man reinforces white male patriarchy and reveals the actual target audience for the commercial. Customers with the free time and financial means to shop around for better insurance rates, i.e. the residents pictured on the screen. The salt and peppers fetishized bodies and music provide signifiers against which privileges of privileged audiences can identify themselves. Philosophies about the appropriation of musical forms from subaltern groups tend to focus on hipness, especially when the styles are coded as masculine and black like jazz and hip hop. From the perspective of advertising scholars, ideas about hipness follow what marketers see as trendy. Hip-hop has been coded by advertisers as hip because of their presumed ability to target marginalized populations defined as urban, lower to middle class African American and Latino youth. I find that Gagrin's commercial offers the potential to begin conversations that can unite these perspectives on hipness, precisely because of its status as an outlier of both definitions. This commercial is unusual in that it does not use signifiers of young, trendy hip-hop artists, nor does it claim to advocate for the appropriation of black male signifiers to create white hipness. Instead, Salt and Peppa and their song are stripped down to fetishized signifiers used to uphold the conservative ideologies of the presumed target audience, ideologies about the ethics of white-collar work, the nuclear family, and home ownership. The song is no longer about pleasure, and the trio is not celebrated as hip-hop pioneers, nor as empowered women. They become colonized by a form of patriarchal nostalgia, and are reduced to entertaining backdrops. Accordingly, this commercial does not appropriate hip-hop to attract marginalized or urban audiences. It rejects it, in order to define the insurance company's true target audience. In this way, the spot reinterprets Pushy, Push It, allowing it to hint at old-school hip-hop and make a joke for those who know what the song is really about, while still avoiding conservative backlash. I leave you with the idea that marketing works, much like the examples of appropriation Robin James gives in her article on taste, hipness, and white embodiment. As a hegemonic discourse, advertising too reveals itself as an institution for privilege and its ability to select specific signifiers from marginalized groups and discard others in a way that reaffirms its insider status and dominant culture. I now open the floor to a discussion of what to do with texts like this and with an industry that seems to prey on marginalized cultures to reproduce hegemonic ideologies. Anything you say about that, John? Yeah. No? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I tripped over a lot of words. I'm a little tired, too. <laughs> oh, well, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I, I was in a, uh, uh, I, I was in a uh, erotics and popular music workshop about three weeks ago with a couple of the women that I was talking about in the hip hop feminism uh, mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. And uh, one of the things, it was a very frank discussion and it was a closed discussion because 
anytime you start talking about uh, you know erotics and sex, it's a, it's a very charged you know field. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's it, and you know just speaking from you know my subject position as a, a heterosexual middle-aged black man you really do it becomes even charged more charged to to have frank discussions about sex and erotics and things like that in public particularly particularly in your professional public but what i learned from that you know you know that little workshop is that you know it's time to really just start going in so that i thank you for going in you know as you did with that but i'd like to propose and uh, uh i completely agree with your reading but i'd like to pr propose a, a multiple you know way to look at it absolutely yeah just to, you know, about the 10 minute what's that about the 10 minute version yeah 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 i know i get it i get it yeah i get it the, the thing that um my response to that 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 commercial uh, is was quite different from that reading, and that's one of the things that I've been trying to uh, really adopt from feminism, you know, as a theoretical construct to you know to really take it seriously as so that I can be a feminist too, and and that's one of the things we were hashing out behind closed doors. So what am I to do with the fact that? Uh, just for my subject position. I remember I'm old enough to have been teaching grade school when that song came out. Mm -hmm. And this kid, why I was teaching, the general music teacher in this class, and this fifth grade girl came into the class with uh, one of those teenage magazines. Mm -hmm. And we were doing something totally different, but she came in and she slammed the thing down and she looked at me. She said, Mr. Ramsey, salt and pepper are perfect. <laughs> she just had to get it off her chest. <laughs> this was in 1986 or 1987 yeah, or so. Yeah. Huh. I suppose they are. All right? So I've, I've been able to see the long trajectory of their career as being from siren to probably grandmothers now. Yeah. And I actually read that commercial and viewed it as number one as a kind of send up of their former selves mm. right that right. Th that advertisers would also understand that there were people like me and the other of these other of, you know others of their fans who had aged with, with them that, yes. you know and and were because my and i'm just going to just say it i the, the, when i saw them on the, the thing i was like Hey, they still curvy. Look at them, you know. <laughs> Look at them still working it, you know, and pushing it, and almost making fun of it. And so, I'm wondering, is there any way for us? And then also, I, I still find them, uh, but you know, wearing those clothes that you know that they don't wear in in everyday life to the grocery store. Hopefully, they don't. Yeah. <laughs> you know. That, they, that this thing could just be, a, and I'm not deep refuting your reading yeah, at all. That is, uh -huh. So is there possibilities for multiple readings of this kind of, kind of, and you probably had that in a longer version, or maybe you didn't, but can you just speak to this idea, you know? I, I love that you bring that up. So like I said at the beginning, advertising is a semiotic minefield, and the best part about it is, well, the best part for advertisers is that it's short, and they can just throw a bunch of signifiers at you, mm -hmm. and you can pull from it what you want. So um, I find it really interesting that you really liked this. When I first saw it, I actually was grading papers, and I had the television on mute, and I looked up, and I thought, oh god, that's not what I think it is. And I turned on the sound, and I was, I, I've been disturbed, like deeply disturbed. Right. Right. <laughs> but I said that the second right. came out. But I work on advertising, like that's what I do. Right, right, um, right. And right. I read all the stuff about it, so I'm always constantly critiquing it. And I think what you bring up is a brilliant point, because this is why I struggled with this, because I think where I found the term finally was who is the audience. And yes, some of the audiences are people that age with them. Um, but if you, I read about insurance companies and uh, what their audience is, and they have realized that the only way to make money is to coach from other people, right? Because it's one of those commodities that like you have to have, but you know, you're not, it's not like Pepsi, you can't buy it over and over again, really. 
Um, so in that effort to poach, um, they're doing very specific things. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. this is you know, one example of, of what they're doing. Nostalgia works, right? But then the problem with nostalgia is, like I see it, is they're, like, kind of, like I said at the end, they're kind of colonizing their signifiers and only using the ones that gets them the cultural capital for you to remember the commercial. Um, while discarding all of those other things that we know that Push It is about and that makes us dance to it, right? And it's about the body, and except for this isn't about the body, this is about something else. And so something that I'm always struggling with is meaning, right? And what, advertisers are very clever in, with their semiotics. Mm -hmm. Some, well, and by clever, I mean they think they're being clever, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, sometimes they feel miserably. Um, so yeah, this is I I have been coming at it from different angles, and when this becomes bigger, yeah. absolutely, there is the you know the thing that I do talk about is the fact that salt and pepper they make great money off of it, and this is a great promotional tool for them. And right. I am not right. giving them any flack for that, but if you think about it, they have to work within this patriarchal mm -hmm. system. Advertising is still very patriarchal. Um, and very white still, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we've all seen that one, right? Um, it still looks like that in many ways, and so um, they yeah. have to use the system to get what they need. Yeah, I guess. I guess maybe the, the, what it, what's what's what could be useful is a reading that points to all of the conflicted. You know all of the conflict because I totally buy your reading it. You know mm -hmm. totally, particularly with the from the advertising you know point yeah. of view. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, why am I blinded to it then? You know when I'm usually sensitive to those things. It could it be just salt and pepper? I'm just like oh salt and pepper. And That's and all I can think about. Like familiarity and honestly, we're trained by this. Right. I I, I mean we see it all day every day. Yeah. When you you can't be YouTube without a commercial, right? So I'm not I'm not saying that for some reason you're not being critical of it. I'm just saying we're trained. It's just like I mean you know this with Western music and the tropes that from opera that make it into film music. We're trained that a single violin and playing on a slow tempo in a minor key is sad. We're supposed to feel sad, so we just feel sad, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It, I'll talk to you some more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm telling you, there's a long history of this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor Love, for your um, presentation. I love salt and pepper. I have so many awesome memories um, of their, uh, the trajectory of their career. I'm wondering, um, methodologically, um, uh, how does um, sort of reception um, feedback figure into it in terms of like um, African American women saying how it registers for them? Um, or maybe even the black feminist um, scholars like Trina and Brittany, um, what their sort of reading of it would, would, it, would be um, if that figures into the larger project. Absolutely, it does. I'm so glad that you brought that up, and that's like all, you know, all the cutout stuff. Um, but yeah, so part of what I did is I wanted to know what people were saying, and by and large, people just kept saying it's nostalgic. You know, it's nostalgic. That's the thing that I thought of when I saw this letter. Yeah. I thought it was really retro. Like, if, like okay. last year especially, like everybody was wearing leather sweaters, um, yeah. embracing that sort of nostalgia, even on like HBCU campuses, so historically black colleges and universities. I dusted off a whole bunch of stuff. So, I'm, you know, like, I, I'm, I'm curious about the sort of yeah. retro uh, reclamation of style that might also be a conversation. Absolutely, I really like taste that. Taste and stylistic approach. Absolutely, yeah, I, I think that, yeah, this, again, it, it, it goes back to what kind of nostalgia, what's, what's uh, being lost, mm -hmm. what's being claimed, you know, who's getting what out of these signifiers? If the community's getting it, then awesome, you know? But I know that Geico's also getting some of it, right? I mean, they, so this, uh, I think I also put up, this was in rotation for a while, and Geico paid an extra $4.5 million to put 30 seconds in the Super Bowl. So that they know that this is a valuable cultural signifier. And 
they're huge. And the Mark Agencies in Virginia, in Richmond, Virginia. <laughs> so, you know, these people are around where I am, and, you know, I, um, ethnography is the next part of my project, actually, um, for this. I didn't get to them before this happened, but. Um, what what is the white community? What the the white community? <laughs> like three charge things that probably could be going <laughs> right? Could go, go so many different ways. But what about say eight? You know uh, the the middle aged uh, white consumer, right? Who relationship to hip-hop culture is totally different than mm -hmm. it was in 1987. Yeah. This is something I'm just wondering like about. people that have grown up with this. Yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah. Um, I mean, again, they just keep saying, this is so great because it's nostalgic. Yeah, like, yeah. That, that's the, the thing that keeps coming up over and over. Yeah. Well, actually, on that topic, uh, oh. on the microphone, microphone. Microphone. It's not, it's not, it's not the microphone. Is your mic on? Okay, yeah. That's okay. I think I'll it doesn't seem uh, real. On that topic, uh, on the currency of nostalgia, and then also the semiotics here, the last scene in particular, right. all these kinds of things, and also in your title, Sonic Hip, is made me think of the hipster. Yeah. Where, like, nostalgia is the currency of the so called hipster, right? And this kind of, the entire commercial to me was kind of appealing to that um, demographic, if, if we can you know, pinpoint that as being a demographic. But, you know, Rather than read it as a, a wholly conservative kind of thing, where we're talking about people who have the financial means to uh, shop around for insurance plans, it's also a very neoliberal one too. Absolutely. It says that you know, hip hop is cool yes. and it's hip, and you know, it allows for this kind of neoliberal, that's uh, that's equal that, yeah. opportunity uh, kind of cultural feel. When really there's some very conservative and very exclusionary. Oh my yeah, 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 yeah. So I like that. Yeah. Into yes. Life. Commercial. Mm -hmm. So I just wondered if you thought about that, especially since it's in the title. Really oddly, I did because of the last thing that I quoted, Robert Daly's talking about hipsters, and what kept coming into my mind as I was writing this is advertising is like hipsters because she talks about how they have the privilege to appropriate the signifiers they want and mm -hmm. discard the ones they don't, right? Mm -hmm. And so advertising in so many ways does. And um, in terms of what you're talking about with the, the cultural capital of hip hop, again, the other huge theoretical minefield I got into and in history is the history of hip hop and advertising. Again, it's usually males, it's usually youth that's supposed to you know, Sprite Obey Your Thirst, right? That whole campaign, Dan Charnas has this whole book, right? The big payback is about this. Um, usually hip hop is also like praised in a specific way. It's not that this isn't praising it, but it's really not that of living. It's, we're supposed to laugh, right? We're supposed to laugh at it. The use of irony is a very hipster, you know, technique, if you will. Absolutely. Practice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I was fascinated Again, by the symbiosis of it, it's very rich. It's going to reward many readings, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I kept thinking, like, if this was a paragraph in Minimum Moralia, what would it, where would it go? Because it's like the material, where, how it links to the materiality of the economy. I mean, if, yeah. if we all have car insurance, oh, and this thing is such a sort of, it's, it's really symbolic in terms of, oh, just have this signifier for that signifier. It's almost a caricature of a kind of, you know, society the spectacle type of thing, or yep. symbolic economy. And music is just, has a certain kind of effective function within that. So then I kept thinking about these two spheres. One is that they need money. And this is one of the few ways to make money with music, it, is to be able to do something like this. This is what right? all, all scholars about are talking about. Right, so this, yeah. is, this is a major income. So this is sort of allegory yeah. that can be made about, you know, about the state of capitalism and music now. And then, and then the other material linkage is to all of the horrible car accidents that are happening all the time, right? And it's not because, I mean, we have to have car insurance, and it, so it's not as though, okay, there's some great deliberation. It's like, oh, I want to forget about the car accident. But there is the fact that car accidents are these extremely violent, very unpredictable things that are very horrifying, and they just come out of nowhere, and they do really bad things. And then the fact that hip hop is part of this symbolic web that is extra, that there's just a really strong veneer to it. So I mean, I kept thinking about these allegorical levels at which this could be read as sort of, you know, as some kind of allegory for a material question about political 
Absolutely, they don't. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, please. Yeah. Um, I guess picking up on Mike's comment and some of your comments earlier, I wonder, um, but yeah, I mean, I was thinking, like, this is really, I mean, this is really about big capital and using big capital. Um, the figures you mentioned, $4.5 million, I don't know, you know, what cut of that's all that we got. I'm, I'm, sure was, I'm sure it was a substantial cut. Um, but at the end of the day, I was just wondering if, um, on top of the kind of uh, hermeneutic or symbiotic reading uh, from a kind of top down ideology critique perspective, you might talk about Saul Professor's perspective from kind of the bottom up. Yes. Or, you know, um, way. I was thinking of the Certo, um, you know, strategy versus uh, tactic. Absolutely. Um, the corp- and his, you know, his example is corporations. Individuals caught in this kind of top down ideological web always use tactical uh, maneuvers in order to kind of inhabit uh, you know, the master's house, as it were. I wonder if you thought about that. Or I have, and I really, I know, I'm again, I thought that you brought that up. Um, the, one, the one time that um, I think it was, it was Salt that was in an interview, the, the only feedback I've gotten from them, again, <laughs> same kind of language. She said she read, her son read the script with her, and they just thought it was hilarious, and so of course they did it. So yes, we have to give them the agency for that. They wanted to do it, great. You know, there's the other turn. The other thing that's going on here is that um, Salt became very religious, and she wanted to strip all of those signifiers. Like their recent concert tour, she's been wanting to strip Mm. those kind of signifiers. It's really tough to do with a song like Push It. Like it's, and so this is part of what I'm wrapping. Again, this is like this semiotic web and theoretical web. It's really fun and really easy to get stuck in. But I think that, yes, going the other way is absolutely valid. Yeah. I, I think, I'm sorry. I wonder also if the guy who I mean, I'm sure they have focus groups, right? Yeah. The Martin ABC would. Or the ABC. Yeah. Those are probably not. No, I mean, it's going to be, I almost got in to see them, but then it was going to, it was going to be clear that I'm a wolf in sheep's clothing, so I didn't go on that trip. But at some point, I will kind of, I will do that. It's tough to do this when you criticize it, right? It's hard to get into, yeah. you know, eth- ethically, you want to be fair, right? Um, but yeah, those, they don't release that thing, because they need it, too, for themselves, and they, they, you know, they're clients, they're not going to reveal that. I like that piece about um, her um, um, privileging her Christian identity. That is a strong aspect of her narrative, yes. especially since her collaboration with Kirk Franklin and Stomp. That has been placed to the fore. Yeah. So that might, in terms of their agency as artists, that would be really conv- yeah. convincing mm-hmm. to me in terms of um, gospel music yeah. uh, discourse right. that mm-hmm. she yeah, or they is. asserted mm-hmm. um, their sort of morality codes about what sorts of right. music and what parts of their music they were willing to yeah. mm-hmm. perform. Mm-hmm. I think that that's, mm-hmm. yeah, right. Their agency. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, yeah. I really liked your paper. I thought it was really interesting. And it makes me think about how um, other examples that you, know, you accumulate in your life of the, the way that the culture industry tries to, um, to me, it seems intentionally like uh, diffuse what was once a sort of revolutionary or politically charged or uh, progressive um, genre or act or song. It reminds me of the, I think last Super Bowl, the, there was like a Jeep commercial that used the Woody Guthrie song, mm-hmm. which, is your land, which is a communist anthem, right? right. <laughs> People should accumulate capital. <laughs> and it was being used to sell Jeeps. And I, I was, as I was watching you, paper, I was thinking about how it's one thing to be like, oh, this is nostalgic, or oh, I love Salt and Pepper, I love Woody Guthrie, this commercial makes me feel good. But then in another way, it seems like it's a very canny and, in, 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 you know, I don't want to be conspiracy theorists, but it seems sort of intentional right. to say that like, oh, you know, we're going to take this communist anthem and actually use it to make people feel good about buying jeeps. <laughs> um, yeah. There's something really dark about that. <laughs> and, and the fact that we say, oh, I love this song, that's also dark. So, yes. Yeah. Well, I think about the, uh, the Nike, when Nike used the Beatles Revolution, like that was a really big deal. 
because, you know, the Libby Beatles did not allow that, but Becca Jackson controlled their catalog, and so that was all the rock people said, this is not what this song is about, right? It's not about running shoes. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's something about the culture history wants us to forget what the song is exactly yes yeah no you're absolutely right and that's that's what i do in a lot of my work is what are we forgetting mm. Mm. yeah but doesn't this kind of circle back to what uh the per, what the uh, feminists the hip-hop feminists were describing as percussive yeah these things that mm -hmm seemingly don't go together, these things that you have to kind of embrace the contradictions, uh, the, the hypocrisies. Yeah, exactly. The, you know, the hypocrisies, basically. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, I'm, I'm re you know, listening to your talk, and I'm thinking, you know, why are you messing with my commercial? You know? <laughs> I, I did but, a really good job of being Yeah, but it's, like, I mean, everything you said was perfectly yeah. reasonable and perfectly in sync with my, my political values, right, you right, know, yeah, right? But true. then I can look at the commercial and say, ah, uh, you know. Right, I'm sorry, I just broke it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Reminds me of a similar commercial um, was for uh, Sirius XM Radio, where it was three, Two, I think it's two white guys and an Asian guy riding in a, in a Buick Saber going to a business meeting, and, and on the radio is a rap song. Uh, it's called Two G's, and you know, so you hear them, and they're they're lip syncing the words, right? So they are actually going to a business meeting. They're actually talking about making money, right? And bringing out that connection maybe between you know hip hop and, and business culture. Mm -hmm. But then of course, you know, when the boss calls, they have to turn the rap off and you know speak to the boss in sort of you know measured tones and, and then they turn the music back on once that's over. But you know another another maybe another case where Absolutely. Uh, you know the, some ambiguous things are I mean because I think people love to use I, I'm always very uh, this idea of, of how white people react to rap in, in a commercial like this or in other situations where they they don't necessarily feel comfortable uh, like singing push it or rapping push it, but they like it, but they can't necessarily, and by day I say to myself, right, um, they like it, but can't necessarily embrace it in, in a way. And so a commercial like this kind of bridges that gap and also highlights the sort of difference between the, the hit language, the popular language of salt and pepper, which is very, uh, you know, exciting, and the dull language of the guy with the long horn. Yes. <laughs> there's a certain sense in which there's like, um, I mean, the dirtiness of, of white culture making fun of itself a little bit. Absolutely, yeah. And I, maybe I said, you know, like, wow, well, we're, we're making, we're laughing at the fact that he's really not hit. Um, I, I think it's significant that he gets the last word. I mean, that's my semiotic reading of it. Um, because it's that moment where it really juxtaposes bodies and sound as racial sounds, and he's clearly the white sound, and they're the black sound, and it's very, I don't know, that's where I feel the moment of the most rubbing. And it ends, and you're like, what? You know, you want it to like resolve in some magical way, and it didn't. Well, I'm still uncomfortable with the dichotomies and the binaries that, that we seem to be relying on for the reading. Right. I, I just can't accept the fact that this song, what we're, what we're denying is that this song is now part of pop culture. Exactly. So anyone can learn it. So, uh, yeah, and I don't think that that is, you certainly won't see the musicians who are the agents claiming that people should not consume their music. Right and claim it as their own. It's almost as if it's, mm. we are stuck in these kind of uh, assignments, these racial and geographical and gendered assignments. It's sort of like uh, when everybody was getting down on Beyonce when she said she was a feminist, the arguments came, the arguments became about the people themselves, not about her. Everybody had their own investment in their own idea about who she was in relationship to themselves, and so then that became the argument. It wasn't about her political 
you know her her affiliation so I, I don't know I've seen commercials where the you know a, a white person is rapping all of the lyrics and then they're doing it you know you have these newscasters who are off camera and they're dancing and doing all the busting the moves you know very convincingly I think what's the, it's almost as if there's a joke going on in the whole culture is that you guys are all listening to the same music, you're all consuming the same music, but then we're all at the same time realizing that there's some racial ideologies out there that keep us in our place. Well, and so I'm wondering, loves those. what's that? Well, advertising loves those because that's how you identify yourself. They will do everything Got to it. make you identify yourself. Okay. Whether it's sound, vision, like body type, whatever it is, you have to find yourself in there, and it has to happen in thirty okay, seconds. Okay, well, let's have some fun here now. Yeah, do it. Let's have some fun. Would you, I, you keep wanting to make the advertisers the winners, and I'm oh. trying to say. But because you're saying that it's still going their way, right? And I'm saying that maybe it's not going their way. In terms of? In terms of who gets to? How people to, are reading it. How people are reading okay, it. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Boy, it's good. <laughs> I know. They, they, welcome to my web. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. Um, yes. Before we go, the time. <laughs> and we might have to go, um, there was a couple of things I wanted to just sort of speak about, just briefly about this piece and also about what you said, Paul, it was very interesting, but maybe this one first, you know. I mean, like, we're the audience. Well, you know, because what was that movie where um, the old white people are sitting in a cabin and they're listening to soul music and reliving their past. What was the name of that movie? The Big Chill. That's right. I couldn't remember it. And so that's what this thing reminded me of. I hadn't seen it before. Because hmm. the only thing I watch on television now is what my son watches. He's 10. <laughs> and he likes the gecko. He doesn't like the rest. So the thing is that, you know, I mean, draining, I, I think the person who said draining, I think I'm saying in my own words, draining transgression from the music. Mm -hmm. to make it usable for yeah. advertising. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. they've been doing that. I mean, you know, that was the Cosby Show strategy. They said, well, why didn't you talk about racism? And Alan Poussaint said, racism isn't funny. So, you know, we're, we're a comedy show. So, I mean, and, and you know, what happened to Salt and Pepper? You know, it already happened to jazz, you know. I mean, right. they, it's not in Starbucks, and people don't remember the transgressors they throw anymore. And, and like you said, what are they going to say? Don't use my song? Well, actually, some people do. Didn't they tell Donald Trump, don't do it? You know, <laughs> some, people actually, some people actually do have limits there. But I mean, you know, Guy called Trump, maybe. Well, I don't really know. Maybe they're not that different. Then, but then you also, I think at your point about, about them removing these aspects, you know, the racially, sig the strong racial signifiers, you know, there's that old Jane Cortez uh, poem, they, they want the oil, but they don't want the people. Mm -hmm. So when you look at that kind of thing, you sort of say, well, we're filtering that out so we can have what we want. But I would want, I would want to look at the advertising company's internals. Mm -hmm. The audience is also the company. Yeah. You know, that's why you get, um, you know, all these shows where the white writers are trying to write black characters, it's not just working. But within the company, it all seems fine, and they're laughing at each other and slapping and doing all that and high fives, and you can use and you can like, what you doing? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but that was my response, but I had about two minutes, and I wanted to play this song for you, Paul. Oh, oh that last part, oh yeah, I forgot about the part, I had it written down here. Do you remember that controversy about the Volvo, the Volvo dealerships in the black community where they, they said, why aren't you guys targeting the black consumer? And they said, we want prospects, not suspects. Wait a minute. So, <laughs> wow, I didn't So, I didn't yeah, we just looked that up. It was very interesting. And, um, <laughs> you know, it went on like that. But, I mean, I'm saying that the, that's an internal company situation. Right. It's not audience versus. I mean, right. they've got their own sets of ideologies. It's like uh, you know, Aaron Johnson talking about jazz and how jazz gets marketed, there's a lot of internals there. But this is my song, I can't show you the visuals, I can show you the visuals, I can't show all the, well I could, I could. Should I try it? Yeah, Let me try it, after all, it's past 11 anyway. No, it's almost 11, we have one minute. Let's see if I can do this. Um, so 
Sorry about that. Yeah, with Thanks the Thanks for going down the rabbit hole. This could be fun. Oh, yeah. I was like uh, weeping in the uh, uh, Thanks for some tape. Okay. I'm going to try <laughs> doing this. Let's see. Where's my yeah, little... Yeah, we have a 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just like that, that's a book. book. That's a book. Oh, I know. Right? Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 I can do that. I'm keeping it. Okay, turn that. Yeah. Pull that. Pull those down. Okay, great. Okay, pull the iPod up. Okay. Yeah. Let's see what happens here. Oh, uh, okay. This could be fun or it might not be because of what we're doing. Oh, there we are. Okay. All right, so this is it. So this is an old painting from the Afro-Cobra artist, um, Jeff Donaldson. It, it's called Down Pack Jelly Tide from 1988, one of the founders of that movement. And um, it's sort of, a, it's, there's, there's steganography in the image. It's like one of those, it's their thing about Kool-Aid colors. Kool-Aid colors. Colors all over the place and all that. But so but there, are these, there are these figures in the, in the thing, the figures in the ground are a big part of it. And I think probably a lot of you recognize the figure on the left, if you look carefully, but maybe you won't. Um, and the figure on the middle, you might not know, but I'll just tell you, that's Blue Hall of the Abrams, uh, the ACM color. And on the right, is a, a former member of the ACM, after the age of 26. So I thought, okay, let's see. We've got the ACM, we have uh, Charles Clark, we have Mason, we have Soul Brother number one. And what would they all sound like if they played together? <laughs> But it has to be a little louder. to be loud. That had to be loud. Yeah, that had to be loud. loud, but I mean, I understand yeah. what's happening there. But 
Anyway, that was my brief thought about what, what you said. It was very exciting, I thought, to try, try to think about that. If, if there's any definition that's going to come out of that, you know, I don't know if there is. Thank you. <laughs>